Bolsheviks again. Uh, but uh, uh, a very strange support from very strange quarters came for the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, this is, of course, Barry Herzog, uh, the head of the National Party. He greeted the Bolshevik Revolution and he said at the uh, party convention in 1919 uh, that uh, if we say that we have the right to govern ourselves, meaning we, the Afrikaners, the National Party, uh, when we feel that our duty to see that this right is fulfilled, then we are the South African Bolshevists. Uh, this line was continued by uh, D.F. Malan, uh, who was later on uh, an, an author of a party, the main author, author of a party. He said the same thing. The aim of the Bolsheviks was that Russia uh, should manage her own affairs without interference from the outside. This was the same policy that nationalists would follow in South Africa. The Bolshevists stand for freedom, just like the National Party. It is obviously absolutely clear where it comes from because uh, uh, the National Party at that time perceived its, its main enemy uh, the British Empire. And of course, the British were against the Bolsheviks and they were part of the intervention in Russia. So that's why the support from uh, the National Party. This was not to last long, of course. Uh, uh, the National Party was soon to uh, discover how dangerous for it the radical uh, socialism is. There were other uh, quarters from which the support for the Bolsheviks came. This is Olive Schreiner in her later years. Olive Schreiner, the, uh, the South African uh, famous writer, uh, she was a socialist. She was a friend of the Karl Marx's family. Uh, she knew the European socialists well and was close to them. And she, of course, she was too old to uh, participate in any revolutionary activities by the time of the revolution. Uh, but she greeted the Bolsheviks' revolution with all her heart. And uh, she wrote later that she read every single book on Russia, which was available in 1917. Uh, uh, the main support for the Bolshevik revolution came from the International Socialist League. International Socialist League was an organization which emerged from the split of the Labour Party in 1915. They first quarreled about the participation in the war. Uh, the uh, uh, several leaders, including Bill Andrews, uh, David Ivan Jones, and Sidney Bunting, were against South Africa's participation in the war. And uh, uh, they were also uh, uh, <coughs> advocating the defeat of their own government in that war. Uh, that was a position which was exactly, reflected exactly the position of the Bolshevik party. Uh, so uh, they uh, uh, organized their own uh, party, which was International Socialist League, and this was the precursor of, uh, uh, of the future Communist Party. They were all people who came from the labor movement, but they were all completely different. Bill Andrews was a trade unionist through and through, and by then he was already a prominent leader. David Ivan Jones uh, was, uh, had workers' origins, but uh, he was an amazing person of amazing talents. He spoke 11 languages. Uh, and when he got to Russia finally, uh, he learned Russian in just one, one year uh, and translated Russian articles and translated uh, Russian papers for his colleagues in, in Moscow. Uh, now, Sidney Bunting was uh, uh, a, a brilliant graduate of Oxford University who came to South Africa during the Anglo-Boer War and stayed to become the most ardent Bolshevik. Now, this is the uh, sort of certificate uh, of the International Socialist League given to one of the communists. Uh, I think it was Sam Balin, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Sam Balin, uh, that he paid one pound uh, to create the, uh, international, the, the International League's press. 
the International Socialist League had a big problem on its hands uh, because uh, uh, its constituency, the workers, was completely divided. Uh, the majority of the workers were black, uh, but the absolute majority of the organized workers were white, and they were not only white, they were Afrikaners. And the two constituencies did not like one another. Uh, the Afrikaners certainly were afraid of uh, the competition from the black workers because not many of the Afrikaners were very well qualified at that time. And so the uh, less qualified white workers were afraid of the competition from the black workers because the black workers could be paid less. Uh, so the International Socialist League announced that it has complete equality be be between all workers in its ranks uh, and that in any organization, both black and white workers should be uh, admitted and accepted and welcomed irrespective of creed or race or color. Now, in practice, it turned out that it is much more difficult to implement than, uh, than they said. Uh, the International Socialist League published a lot of pamphlets and uh, the, its main newspaper was uh, uh, the International. Uh, it followed the uh, Bolshevik Revolution uh, virtually every day. It published Lenin's articles, it published his speeches, uh, it gave uh, uh, the fullest possible coverage to events in Russia at that time. Uh, now, the second paper, the Bolshevik, or Bolshevist, no, Bolshevik, uh, was actually a newspaper of another party which called itself the Communist Party of South Africa, but it was not the Communist Party which, was, uh, which later came into existence. Uh, here. Uh, there were several organizations which uh, came into existence uh, after uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. I will not give you all the names. The problem was that all of them what, wanted to, uh, to join the Communist International. All of them applied for membership immediately after the Communist International was created in 1919. Uh, but Lenin admitted only one organization from, which, from each country, and that organization had to have a particular program. For example, it had to accept uh, that various forms of struggle are uh, used. For example, not only the armed struggle, but also uh, parliamentarianism, participation in parliament, parliamentary elections. Uh, so, uh, the South African organizations, many of them, had to unite. The International Socialist League was the biggest of them and the strongest of them and best organized, and so it uh, organized the other parties around themselves, around itself, and finally they created the Communist Party of South Africa. This is its first Congress. Uh, this was in... Uh, uh, late July, early August, 1921. Uh, as you can see, this is also all only white and mostly male uh, leadership of the party. But, of course, uh, uh, at that time, that is what the party was. Uh, uh, I must also mention, of course, that many of the uh, members of the party at that time were of Russian Jewish origin. Uh, in South Africa at that time, in 1921, were about 25,000 Russian Jews who came uh, to South Africa in the late 19th, early 20th century who ran away from Russian pogroms. Uh, and many of them still had Russian passports. Uh, gradually that stopped, but uh, almost 25,000 and many of them had very uh, revolutionary inclinations. Uh, now, the uh, Communist Party, until then, until uh, almost its existence, uh, almost into, uh, until its coming into being, did not see any Russians, did not have any information whatsoever 
uh, from a live Russian about the revolution. So in 1919, three Russians came to South Africa. Uh, they ran away actually from the civil war. One of them was a Bolshevik, one of them was a Menshevik. And of course, uh, the South African communists immediately uh, started organizing a lecture for them. This happened in uh, uh, March 19, February 1919. The lecture took place in the city hall in Johannesburg. Uh, the party organized it very, very well. They concealed entirely what these people were going to speak about and announced it as a lecture about uh, red atrocities in Russia. Uh, so uh, thousands came, uh, including the workers and including the mayor and all the top officials. Uh, and uh, then the orchestra started playing and they expected uh, God Save the King, uh, but it was the international, the anthem of uh, uh, socialists, international socialist movement. Uh, and that's how it started. Uh, then the lecture went on. Uh, and uh, the workers put away the rotten tomatoes and eggs that they, they brought because they thought that it was going to be anti-Russian uh, lecture. And uh, the rest of the public uh, had to see through it and then hated it as much as they could. But nothing could be done. The crowds uh, walked along the streets of Johannesburg the whole night. Uh, and they sang the international, and the police did not intervene because it was absolutely impossible. Only in a few days they asked the Russians to go, uh, and they gave them mon the money to leave the country. Uh, one of the communists, the one who organized the lecture and did it all so cleverly, was a Russian emigre, uh, and he went with them, and uh, finally, after years, uh, a year of tortuous travel, he arrived to Moscow and he was the first South African to bring the news about uh, South African communist movement to the Comintern. He wrote a very detailed report and uh, uh, that report is still in the Russian archives. That's why we know uh, everything about it. And uh, uh, the, then he disappeared. The only other thing that uh, is in the archive in his file is that a year later he asked for a permission to leave Russia. Uh, the reason for it is not indicated. Uh, now, even before the party was organized, the so other South Africans went to visit uh, uh, Russia. One of them was Sam Balin, who was mentioned earlier, and the other one, and more importantly, was David Ivan Jones. Uh, David Ivan Jones arrived there in 1921, and immediately he was uh, promoted to uh, the executive committee of the Communist International. Uh, he corresponded with Lenin and Trotsky. Uh, he sat on committees with all the prominent Russian Bolsheviks. Uh, he uh, was a close, uh, uh, in close connection, close connection with Bukharin, uh, and uh, and so on. Unfortunately, he died. He died of um, tuberculosis in 1924 and is buried in Moscow. Uh, the Fourth Congress in 1922 was, uh, 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 was um, uh, uh, attended by Sidney Percival Bunting and by Bill Andrews. Bill Andrews was also promote, promoted to the uh, executive committee of the Comintern. Now, at home, the situation was uh, uh, very... Uh, difficult for the party. It was just organized when in 1922 several of the mining firms on the Rand decided to lift uh, the color bar just a bit, uh, just for the lower uh, qualified workers because of course they wanted to pay less to the blacks. So that's how the white workers were the situation. The whites have to go so that the room is uh, uh, free for the blacks to come in and take their places. Now in 1922 that of course ended in the famous Red Revolt or Rand Revolt 
uh, of which, of course, you all have heard. Uh, this was the revolt of the white workers against the black workers. And you can see the uh, famous slogan of that, uh, right, how does it work? The famous slogan of that revolution. Uh, white workers, uh, workers of the world, unite and fight for white South Africa. Uh, that was certainly not what the Communist Party liked. And it tried to tell them that you have to unite with the black workers. Uh, but uh, the workers did not, the white workers did not uh, listen to that. And that remained the slogan of uh, that revolution. Now, the Bolsheviks, the communists, South African communists, still uh, were in the forefront of that revolution, and they still uh, went ahead and pushed the workers further and further along the radical line. Uh, of course, it was suppressed. It was suppressed by the army, uh, artillery. Uh, even aircraft was brought and bombed the workers, and finally it was, uh, uh, it was suppressed. Uh, and the communists bore the brunt of it. Uh, after that, the National Party decided that it has to buy uh, the white working class, and that's how it started. But uh, the party continued. Uh, the party work was to organize schools, evening and summer schools for workers, particularly black workers, uh, uh, participating in the work or in, in the trade unions, and uh, putting its members uh, in other organizations. For example, uh, communists were in the leadership of the first black trade union. Clemens Kadali was head of it, uh, secretary of the Industrial Commercial and uh, uh, Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, which was the first trade black trade union in South Africa. They also worked very closely with Josiah Gumede, uh, at that time the president of the African National Congress. In both cases, it did not quite work. Uh, at some point, uh, Gumeda was uh, removed from the leadership of the ANC, and uh, uh, Kadali refused uh, to cooperate with the communists. But I must mention that Gumeda, in 1927, uh, visited the Soviet Union, and he wrote an absolutely uh, admiring, uh, admiring words about what he saw. He said, I saw the new Jerusalem. Uh, and that's where the light comes from. Uh, the Comintern did not pay much attention to South Africa until 1927. Uh, it just was a member, but there was no special policy, nothing particularly uh, interesting about it. Uh, except, of course, that it was the only communist party in, the, in Africa south of the Sahara. Uh, everything changed uh, from the visit in 1927 uh, of uh, uh, Jimmy Laguma or James Laguma. These are two pictures of the same person, uh, only that that one is where, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, that one was uh, when he was, the right one was uh, when he was young, uh, just about the time when he visited Moscow. Now, uh, James Laguma, again presented, uh, made a presentation about the situation in South Africa, about the Communist Party, and about the position of black workers. And Bukharin, who was chair, who had chaired the session of EKI at that time, EKI is uh, Executive Committee of the Communist International, uh, offered a particular policy, a particular policy for uh, South African Communist Party. Now, that is interesting. It said uh, uh, that South African Communist Party should uh, strive for an independent native republic. Uh, it was defined as a Negro republic independent of Great Britain with autonomy for national minorities. Uh, in 1928, at the Sixth Congress of the Comintern, this was uh, accepted as a, 
uh, as an official policy for South Africa, for South African Party. Uh, the uh, formulations were slightly different now. Uh, independent Native Republic uh, with equal rights for all workers as a stage towards workers and peasants republic. Now, that is very interesting because that's where the second stage starts. You know that the ANC is speaking about national democratic revolution and that now we have to, to go to the second stage. And the second stage is exactly, uh, it started in 1928 with a native, uh, independent native republic and uh, with the uh, second stage, which was going to be a socialist republic. Uh, you would absolutely love it that the formulation of this uh, independent native republic, it continued to evolve. And sometime in the late 1930s, what happened was that it evolved into uh, uh, the demand for independent republics for every race and every nation, national group of South Africa. Uh, it is absolutely lovely because, uh, you know, it is a passade, uh, if you want. So I think that D.F. Malan would have been extremely surprised if he knew uh, that uh, the communists arrived there earlier. But that, uh, that uh, formulation uh, did not somehow register with the Communist Party or with the uh, African National Congress. Uh, so uh, the slogan of independent native republic brought a complete disaster to South African communists. First of all, Sixth Congress, Banting was there and he objected to this slogan vehemently because he said that it would develop uh, black nationalism against white workers. Uh, we shouldn't develop uh, the hatred towards whites on the basis of race. We should develop uh, the uh, struggle against white oppression, not against whites as a race. Uh, and he was right, of course. He said it was very uh, easy to incite black uh, nationalism against the whites, but this is not the correct policy. Now, of course, other people, uh, other people disagreed with him. Other people disagreed with him, uh, and the internal strife in the Communist Party started and continued until the late 1930s. Uh, one of the things that Bunting was saying at that time was that the party was already working among black workers and that black workers were actually joining the party. Uh, which was true. I put this fifth congress of the party here uh, because, as you can see, there are, first of all, women now, and there are quite a number of black people. Uh, now, these were the first, uh, the first uh, black, black people to join the party. This is Ghana Makabeni and this is Tom Tibedi. They were the first two Africans to join the party. Uh, now, these two guys are particularly important because they lived into the, to take the Communist Party message into the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, one is J.B. Marx, and I will, uh, John Beaver Marx, and I shall mention him later if I have time. Uh, and this is uh, Katane, Moses Katane. Both of them became general secretaries of the Communist Party uh, underground. Uh, both of them were in exile. Both of them played an enormous role in establishing uh, the party's relation with the Soviet Union at a later stage. Uh, now, the struggle was not just the struggle within the party. Uh, once the Comintern laid its policy, uh, made it clear, uh, it was eager to uh, check whether the policy was uh, really adhered to and how well South African communists adhered to it, what they did for it, how active they were, and so on and so forth. They sent its own emissaries uh, uh, to check and watch, and uh, uh, there were quite a number of them. We know the names of all of them now. But here, from the point of view of the party, the people who are here, uh, this, I think, has been, oops, 
this, I think, has been um, uh, the most devastating part of the uh, internal struggle in the Communist Party. Uh, now, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, Douglas Walton, uh, the emissary who was sent uh, to uh, the South African Communist Party to lead it. Uh, because the old leadership did not satisfy Stalin. He came in 1930. Uh, now, uh, this, these are the unknown people. This is Sonia Bunting, uh, Bunting, Bunting's wife, who was also a founder member of the Communist Party. Uh, this is uh, uh, Molly Walton, Walton's wife. Uh, and this is Bunting himself. Now, these two people, uh, Walton and Bunting, Bunting, led the two sections of uh, uh, the struggle. Uh, and finally, Bunting was purged. He was um, sacked from the party. Uh, he was accused of Trotskyism. He was accused of racism. Uh, he was accused of all sorts of other uh, scenes uh, which were uh, obviously uh, part of the Bolshevization of the party. What is Bolshevization? Every single communist party under Stalin had to go through Bolshevization. Uh, that was a selection of leaders who were particularly faithful to Stalin and who would uh, through carry on any decision that uh, Stalin's, uh, Stalin required. Uh, so Bunting was never uh, never restored in the party uh, and uh, uh, remained, uh, so, so he soon died actually. Uh, now, Bill Andrews was also purged. Uh, all the old membership was purged. Uh, Andrews was restored a bit later. Now, I think I should miss it because of the lack of time. Uh, but these are the Russian teachers uh, uh, who taught uh, South African communists in the Communist International, because uh, uh, Communist International had universities, schools, and various umbrella organizations, as I told you. Uh, so uh, the reason why I put it here, not just to give you the names of some of them, but uh, because the majority of these people uh, were actually killed in uh, Stalin's, uh, uh, Stalin's purges in the late 1930s. Uh, this is the time now to speak about these purges a bit in connection with South Africa. South African communists did suffer. Not many, not as many as the Chinese or Indonesians or the British or whatever, because uh, uh, all communist parties uh, had their own purges in Moscow. But this is the first black secretary of the Communist Party uh, of South Africa, Albert Nzula. He died in Moscow in 1934. And uh, for a long time, it was thought that he was uh, killed by uh, uh, the Soviet security forces. Now, this is wrong. Uh, he was a student at one of communist universities, and he uh, like many foreigners in Russia, started drinking uh, because it was cold and uh, he was uncomfortable and he is in a foreign country and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, it happened to many students in these communist universities. So uh, Zulu was one of them. Uh, and um, uh, his uh, teachers told him to stop. Uh, one of those in that picture that I showed you before, uh, seeing that he came to him drunk, uh, said, I'm not going to let you in. And he locked the door. And Zula, being drunk in winter, uh, uh, fell asleep on a bench in the snow. Uh, so he was uh, found there, not exactly frozen, but with pneumonia, and he died in hospital of pneumonia. Uh, now, these are the people who were uh, executed or perished in Stalin's Gulag. Uh, they were South African communists of Russian origin, two br uh, br uh, brother, Richter brothers, and Leza Bach. There were also several other people, uh, several other people, uh, uh, Glazer, uh, what was his name? D don't remember. Uh, another communist, Glazer, who was also who also died in the camps. 
Uh, and a couple, da Davidovs, uh, who perished in the camps as well. Uh, so uh, that is a kind of an end of an era. What I want to show you here is that three South African communists were buried in Moscow. Uh, at the top, you can see uh, J.B. Marx's uh, um, uh, um, the memorial on his grave uh, at the most prestigious cemetery in Moscow. Uh, he died in 1972 in a hospital in Moscow, and Katane, uh, Katane died, uh, no, we're on, no. Uh, Katane died in uh, uh, 1978 and is buried there also. I'm wrong, they, they were buried there. Uh, but recently, the ANC reburied them, brought the, the remains and reburied them in South Africa. Uh, while the last grave is that of David Ivan Jones. Uh, and you see the difference uh, in the memorials. The uh, two on top were very well maintained by the South African embassy and by the communists who came. Uh, the lower tomb was never uh, never attended by any South Africans. It was forgotten, uh, and Russian historians found it with great difficulty and sometimes clean it. Uh, now, the new era arrived with the Second World War. This building in Victoria Street, which is now in Cape Town, of course. By the way, I forgot to tell you that the first um, uh, Congress of the Communist Party was also in Cape Town. So this building in uh, uh, the Victoria, in Queen Victoria Street, which is now French consulate, uh, was a Russian consulate from 1942 until 1956. Uh, the consular, consular relations were established in February 1942 uh, because of the needs of the war. And uh, this year, this February, actually, is uh, 75 years since that happened. Uh, the official relations with the Communist Party, between the uh, Soviets and the Communist Party, were almost non-existent at that time. Uh, openly at least. Of course, the uh, staff of the consulate met the communists, uh, South African communists, but mostly their work was centered on the Friends of the Soviet Union Society. The Friends of the Soviet Union Society was an organization which was created entirely by South African communists on the demand of the Comintern. It happened in, in the 1920s, but it, um, uh, it was not very active in the 1920s. It uh, barely did anything. Now, during the war, everything has changed. Uh, they uh, got the money. They got materials from the Russians. They, were, uh, they had thousands of members. They were patronized by uh, Smarts himself. Uh, they, the, the Smarts' wife was uh, a member of the Council of the Friends of the Soviet Union, but all the organizational work was done by the Communist Party. They organized events around it. Uh, medical aid for Russia was one branch of the Friends of the Soviet Union. They collected the money, they collected the blood, they collected medications, they collected Second-hand clothes, all of that was uh, sent to the Soviet Union. Uh, and it is difficult to imagine now uh, what en enormous enthusiasm existed in South Africa for the Soviet Union, about the Soviet Union, about its victories, about its war effort uh, at that time. Uh, but times change. Uh, we are now into the Cold War. And uh, uh, from then on, Russia was never, or Soviet Union was never just another country uh, for South Africa. It was never just another country because, of course, in 1950, the uh, 1953, the Communist Party was banned, or rather it dissolved itself before it was banned. Uh, so it had to go underground. 
1960, the African National Congress was banned, uh, and all of them went into exile, and from then on, there was a close cooperation between the Communist Party and uh, the ANC, to the extent that it is difficult to, it was difficult to distinguish between the activities of the two. Uh, but uh, you can, what you can see here is, of course, the uh, Rui Hefar uh, slogan. It's uh, a brochure uh, of uh, the National Party. Uh, the Russian, uh, oh God, I can't stand it. What is going on here? Uh, the Russian, um, it's not a post, it's actually a cartoon, a newspaper cartoon. This is South Africa and it is shekels. Uh, this is the monopoly capital and this is neo-colonialism. So monopoly capitalism uh, is uh, uh, playing the music and uh, South Africa is uh, uh, trying to uh, enshackle Africa. Uh, so that's how it was presented in uh, Russia. But of course, what happened was that uh, the African National Congress and uh, uh, the Co South African Communist Party getting into exile, the first thing they did, they went to the Soviet Union and asked for help. But before we get there, uh, now this, uh, if, it, it, if it is a Cold War, as in any decent war, there must be spying. Uh, so there was a lot of spy activity in South Africa in particular uh, from, uh, from Russia. Uh, now Dieter Gerhardt was uh, uh, the commander of uh, uh, the South African Navy here in Stellenbosch. Uh, he walked, sorry? Stone. Commandant, yeah. Not Stellenbosch, sorry, not Stellenbosch, Simonstown, sorry. Uh, uh, now, he worked for the South African military intelligence from 1963 uh, until 1983, when he was captured. Uh, he was very lucky because it was so late that he was captured. He remained in prison until 1992, and then he was allowed out, and here he is re reunited with his family. Uh, the second guy is Yuri Loginov, uh, who was uh, uh, captured in uh, 1967 uh, here, too, and uh, he was a... A uh, Soviet spy, he was returned, ex uh, exchanged for somebody else uh, in 1969. Now, this guy is particularly interesting and particularly important. Alexei Kozlov uh, was captured uh, in South Africa in 1980. Uh, his reports were very important for the military intelligence and for all the other intelligence because he reported uh, that uh, ANC was not very strong in South Africa. Uh, in the late 1970s, that was true. 1976 uprising uh, had very little to do with the ANC. Yes, there was some present, presence of the ANC, but they were not important. And that's what he reported back. Uh, moreover, why that was important? Because in 1983, he was also exchanged, and the exchange process, which took place in uh, Austria, uh, took a long time. Uh, it took a long time, several hours and hours and hours, and during the, these hours, uh, the representatives of the two intelligence services, South African and Russian, were sitting together and exchanging their views. Uh, and uh, they found some common ground. Uh, the Russians were interested in what South Africans had to tell them, and the South Africans were particularly interested in the Russians because they thought that the Russians are manipulating the South Africans. Uh, so they established a relationship from 1983. Uh, in 1984, they had a common conference discussing uh, the future relations between Russia and South Africa, between the Soviet Union and South Africa. And I can assure you that 
all the later developments, uh, all the meetings, negotiations, and so on and so forth, would not have taken place uh, if this connection did not exist. Uh, it ended up in 1988 by two top uh, Soviet intelligence officials visiting South Africa at the top of, uh, of the Cold War and uh, apartheid and all that, they visited South Africa on the invitation of Neil Barnard, head of the security services at that time. And they really were very impressed by one another. Now, of course, uh, there were absolutely every possible assistance from the Soviet Union to uh, the African National Congress and the Communist Party. What you see here, uh, the military uh, support, military education, this is the Russian, uh, first Russian instructor of uh, uh, the ANC in Angola. Uh, oh, no. Uh, and uh, uh, this is Tabom Beki. This is Alfred Nzo, the first uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign minister of uh, 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 South Africa after 1994. Uh, this is a very touching picture, I think. You can see it is taken on the cemetery. This is Katana's uh, uh, grave memorial. Now, this is the same person the first instructor only in the later years. And look how touchingly uh, Zuma is holding his can, hand like a small child finally fun, finding uh, uh, a support from somewhere. Uh, now, this is Ronnie Castrils uh, 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 with his wife in later years when he was already a minister uh, in Moscow. This is Moscow State University. And this is the person with whom all South Africans were dealing in the South in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, Sarah, what do we have? Yes, it has been delayed until 4.30. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so uh, he uh, was very important because all South Africa's requests went through him. Uh, and it was uh, he who uh, helped with every possible way. Now, what was there? Uh, the Soviets supplied arms. The Soviets gave the money. The Soviets supplied the tickets for all the ANC and communist travel uh, worldwide. Uh, they um, uh, supplied... Uh, uh, of course, the arms and training and so on. At one point, uh, when the Umkonto we seized, when ANC's military wing uh, uh, was asked to leave Tanzania, where at that moment it was, the Soviets just took the whole contingent and brought it to the USSR and took it, kept it there uh, for three years. Uh, and uh, only then they started to return them to uh, Africa again. Uh, of course, the most important activity in this sphere was started in 1976 when Angola became independent and ANC camps were created in Angola. There were other people who supplied the money, such as Scandinavians, but nobody supplied arms and nobody helped the ANC uh, from the moment they started emigrating, that is, until uh, 1976. All this whole long period when the ANC was scattered in Africa didn't have any other assistance. That is why they are eternally grateful. Uh, now, uh, it was not all that sinister. There was something else about Soviet assistance. There was a lot of humanitarian help. And these are the ANC children in one in the Crimea, in one of the uh, uh, camps in the Crimea. Uh, they are rest houses. Now, the ANC legacy. Uh, sorry, the Soviet legacy for the ANC. Uh, what is the most important thing? The most important thing is not the arms, not even the army, uh, not anything that, uh, that is all forgotten. What is not forgotten is what the senior generation of the present ANC was taught for decades and decades and decades in every possible shape and form. 
and that is the uh, Soviet socialist theory, National Democratic Revolution. I have put here the international meetings of the Communist and Workers' Parties, 1960 and 1969. Uh, the first one, 1960, was the first time when the National Democratic Revolution appeared in the communist language. Uh, it was invented in the depths of the Central uh, Committee, Soviet uh, Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party. Uh, they came up with that notion that you have to have a liberation, liberationary, uh, rebel, liberation, <laughs> sorry, um, a movement which is national movement, liberatory movement, and. Uh, uh, then, after that, once you have the National Democratic Revolution, you have created the conditions for moving to socialism, probably without the revolution, probably in an incremental evolutionary way. This is exactly what the ANC is doing now. And the Communist Party slogan is, uh, uh, socialism is the future, build it now. It is exactly what was said at that time. Now, uh, at that meeting, 1962, people were uh, present. Uh, one of them was Joe Matthews, and here you see him in uh, the circle. The other one was Michael Harmel. Uh, now, 1960, 1962 was the first important Congress of the South African Communist Party. They adopted a new program at that uh, Congress. Now, that program repeated word to word the documents of the uh, 1960 uh, Congress of the Com meeting of the communist parties of the world. Uh, 1969, another Congress which uh, repeated uh, and uh, increased that sort of notion of liberation, national liberation and so on. Uh, before then, Communists and the ANC considered South Africa as a common society. Yes, we are not equal. Uh, this, when socialism arrives, we are all equal, but they did not speak about race. From that time on, uh, uh, colonial, South Africa was perceived as a colonial country, colonialism of a special type. What did it mean? Colony and colonial country in the same territory. That means that was also adopted by the ANC in 1969. So both organizations now have the same policy. Only the ANC never openly spoke that it is going to build socialism. It spoke about the National Democratic Revolution. But if you look at theory, National Democratic Revolution is nothing else except a different way to socialism. So that notion stayed, uh, and that notion remained with the uh, South African Communist Party and the ANC until today. Uh, the allure of the revolution, the allure, why was it so important? Uh, because it promised equality, it promised prosperity, it promised uh, the possibility of uh, uh, deceiving history. Uh, you are a backward, you are poor, but by miracle, just socialist revolution, and you are developed, and you are prosperous, and everything is. It never worked anywhere. It didn't work in the USSR. The next generation is hoping it would work in uh, Cuba. It didn't work in Cuba, okay, it would work in Latin America. It didn't work in Latin America, it would work in Ethiopia or Tanzania. If it didn't work there, it would work in South Africa, or maybe in Europe now. Uh, anyway, uh, what happened, of course, was uh, uh, perestroika. Uh, under Gorbachev, it was still possible for the ANC to hope, here he is Gorbachev with Oliver Tamba, uh, to hope that the cooperation would continue. But it didn't, and uh, uh, Gorbachev started speaking about resolving conflicts by peaceful means. Uh, this meant no revolution and no military assistance to the ANC. And that was one of the reasons why the ANC was uh, forced to uh, go to negotiations. Uh, 
Uh, now, of course, this year is 25 years since uh, diplomatic relations were established between Russia and South Africa, finally. Uh, that was also February, only, only February 1992. Uh, this is the first uh, ambassador, um, first ambassador, uh, South African ambassador in Russia. Uh, who did everything to establish relations with the USSR, but there was not enough time, so he established relations with Russia. I will not go on about the second guy, although that story is interesting. Now, this I put these two pictures here, because in the first years of uh, uh, relations between Russia and uh, South Africa, uh, the relations were not good. Uh, the Soviets were anti-communist at that time, uh, and the first ambassador, Russian ambassador to South Africa said that he would fight communism in South Africa. Uh, so the ANC didn't like that in the, in, uh, in the smallest. It is only after Putin came to power and when Russia has started to develop into the anti-Western, anti-American, uh, anti-European, uh, anti-democratic way that the relations started to warm and started to get closer and closer and closer. And of course it is the closest now. Oh no, sorry, <laughs> I don't know where I am now. Uh, but, uh, the last, the last picture is that. Uh, the last picture is that of um, uh, yeah, and uh, it is very symbolic because uh, uh, it is very symbolic because now uh, South Africans perceive this as another communist international or another uh, organization which is somehow anti-Western, which is somehow going to change the world in a revolutionary direction. Thank you.